Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see everybody today. Had a good rain last night. If you would be opening your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Today we're going to begin in verse 30. Matthew 24, verse 30. Dad, would you lead our prayer for us this morning? In Matthew chapter 24, over the last two or three weeks, we've been looking at this section of verses that's commonly called the Olivet Discourse. And the reason that it's referred to this is because Jesus has gone to the Mount of Olives and there he is seated speaking to his disciples. But just as a reminder of what we see taking place in this chapter, if you would back up to verse 3 and notice that The disciples have come to Jesus, and they ask him these questions. Notice it says that it's private. So this is just Jesus and his disciples, the twelve. They've gathered around him, and they ask three questions. And I mentioned to you that in chapters 24 and 25, we find Jesus answering these three questions. The first of which, they ask, tell us, when shall these things be? Well, this is alluding back to the conversation that Jesus has just finished with the Jews in regard to the destruction of Jerusalem. And so the disciples, they want to know, well, when is this going to happen? When is Jerusalem going to be destroyed? And then the next question they ask, what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So... They're saying, okay, you're saying that Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. When's that going to happen? Then they're saying, well, you're telling us that you're going to come again. What are the signs that we need to be looking for that indicate to us that you're about to come? And then third, they ask the question, well, what about the end of the world? You've talked about the end of the world. What are, what's the signs going to be of the end of the world? Well, in chapter 4 or chapter 24, I'm sorry, we find his answer to these first two questions. And what we've been discussing over the last couple of weeks are the indicators to the Christians that Jerusalem is about to be destroyed. The things that they need to be watching for. And that whenever they see these things taking place, you may remember we talked about this idea of the abomination of desolation. And we talked about how that was referring to the Roman army and how this force, this sinful nation, was going to come in and they were going to bring desolation to the city of Jerusalem. He says, whenever you see them coming, if you're on the top of your house, don't go inside and pack up anything. If you're out in the field, don't go back home and gather your belongings. Get away. Run off. Go up into the mountains, get as far away from Jerusalem as you can. Because if they didn't, then they were going to succumb to that same punishment. Now, where we left off, starting in verse 29, we've talked about the fact that the Jews were going to persecute the Christians. We know that this was something that happened on a large scale right after The church came into establishment. Saul of Tarsus made it his goal in life to completely destroy the church. It was his goal to to bring as many people to their death or to throw as many into prison as he could. 
He focused mainly at the beginning around the city of Jerusalem because that's where most of the Christians were at the time. You remember in Acts chapter 2, we read about the fact that many of those who were converted on Pentecost, they did not immediately leave and go back home. They stayed in Jerusalem because they wanted to learn more. They wanted to sit at the feet of the apostles. And so this persecution started at Jerusalem. Well, they began to scatter when this persecution began. They went back to their homes. They went into other parts of the world. And they carried the gospel with them. And this is why, as we get further into the book of Acts, we see Peter and we see Paul going into certain cities where no apostles and no evangelists had ever visited, but yet when they got there, what did they find? They found the church. This is because many of those who were converted on the day of Pentecost, no, they may not have looked at themselves as evangelists, but they went out and they spread the gospel. They took it with them into their communities. And so the church was established in many of those places and then later strengthened by the apostles coming to be in their midst. But whenever we get to this next section, verses 29 through 35, we see that what Jesus is saying is that after this time of persecution, after the Jews have persecuted the church, after many have been put to death, then this is going to come. And so the first indicator that he's telling them is be watching for the Roman army, but secondly, you're going to face this time of persecution, but something interesting is indicated in this text. Notice it says immediately after those days. The persecution of the Christians by the Jews had virtually ended by A.D. 70. The Romans had taken over, and there were some small pockets of persecution that was being carried out by the Romans at that time. Uh, we know around the city of Rome, there in the 60s, you had the persecution that Nero brought about by accusing the Christians of burning the city of Rome. But this persecution at the hands of the Jews pretty much ended when Saul was converted to Christ. We might refer to him as the ringleader, so to speak. He was the one that had everybody stirred up, had them focused upon this persecution. Well, when he was converted, their leader, their poster child, he was no longer there to carry this out. And so much of that persecution ended. So notice that Jesus is saying is that you're going to face days of persecution, but that persecution is going to end. You're going to see a time of relative peace between the Jews and the Christians. Whenever we look at this section of verses, granted, it sounds very similar to some of the things that we read in other passages that talk about Jesus' second coming. But what we need to understand is this is not intended to be taken literal. What he is going to present to us in these next few verses are symbols. And those in our class on Wednesday night uh, studying the book of Revelation some of these symbols are ones that are going to be familiar to you because these were common things that they used in those days to indicate uh, various issues and various things that were taking place. Notice this is not saying, as some in the Lord's Church today are saying, that Jesus literally came back to earth in A.D. 70. It is not saying that Jesus literally judged the whole world in A.D. 70. But what this is saying is that divine judgment that is coming from heaven came down upon the city of Jerusalem. The way that that was brought about, it was brought about by the Romans. But God was the one that allowed this to take place. God was the one that was bringing this punishment upon the Jewish nation for rejecting Christ. So let's back up, let's read verse 29 and verse 30, and then we'll start our discussion. 
Immediately after the tribulation of those days, talking about the persecution at the hands of the Jews, it says, The sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Sounds very similar to the descriptions that we see both from Jesus and from the Apostle Paul about what it's going to be like when Jesus comes again at his second coming. But looking at the symbolism that's here, and remember, we have to keep things in context. We know without a shadow of a doubt that what he's talking about here is the fall of Jerusalem because he's answering the questions that the disciples asked. And if you continue reading down through this chapter, we're going to get to the point where you can easily see the break in the discussion, where he stops answering one question and goes into another. But looking at verse 29, and we alluded to this just briefly last week, but just as a reminder, in the scriptures, whenever we see this symbol of the sun, usually this is referring to God and God's influence. Well, when it talks about the fact that the sun shall be darkened, what this is talking about is the sinful nature that had come to basically run rampant in the city of Jerusalem. They were no longer allowing God's influence to come into their life. They were not allowing God to direct their steps. And therefore, in this sense, the influence of God has been darkened. Secondly, it says, the moon shall not give her light. The moon, most people look at this and they say, well, this is referring to um, the leaders of the Jewish nation. Those high priests and the scribes. They were the ones that were to be reflecting God's influence to the people. You may remember from your science classes in school that the way that the moon gives forth light is that it reflects light from the sun back to earth. Well, in looking at what this is saying, the ones that were to be seen as the most righteous, the most holy, the ones that were to be looked up to... They were no longer shining forth that light because, as it says, that light had been darkened. It was no longer shining forth from them, and so their leaders were leading them astray. You've heard me say many times that it is my opinion that the point when the Jews completely rejected Christ was when they stood before Pilate and made that statement, we have no other king but Caesar. They completely rejected Christ at that point. Because Pilate stood before them and referred to Jesus as their king. Well, if they were going to accept him, then they could have acknowledged that fact at that point. But they said, no, he's not our king. He's not a king. We only serve one king. We only serve Caesar. Well, at that point, we find that that nation started to become more and more wicked because God's influence was no longer shining forth from their leaders. And the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Most people believe that this is in reference to God's protection and God's blessings. That which had been with that nation, the Jews had been God's chosen nation, and so long as they were faithful to him, he was going to provide for them and protect them. Well, that was all going to cease. That power that was going to that had been coming from heaven, that had been watching over this nation, it was gone. It was going to disappear because of their unfaithfulness. But then coming into verse 30, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Now where some people misinterpret this verse. They look at this and they say that the sign of the Son of Man is going to be seen in heaven. But that is not what this is saying. What this is saying is that the Son of Man in heaven, his sign is going to be seen by those on earth. 
meaning that Jesus is the one that has prophesied that the kingdom is going to be destroyed. Well, when this persecution or this punishment from Rome begins, people are going to immediately put two and two together that this is what Jesus was talking about. That sign was going to be a recollection to them. You know, this is what he told us to be watching for. This is what he said was going to happen. No, it's not saying that in A.D. 70 everybody looked up suddenly and they saw Jesus coming in the clouds. No, that's not what this is saying. It's not saying that there was some type of miraculous vision in the sky that indicated to the people that Jerusalem was about to be destroyed. No, what it is saying is that this event was one of such intensity that it could only have come from divine origin. And that was an indicator to those who were still in Jerusalem that this is God's punishment that's coming on them because of their unfaithfulness. Now you may remember from our class last week, I mentioned the fact that historians have recorded that when the Roman army came to Jerusalem, they came, they surrounded the city, the people there, they saw the abomination of desolation there, and then for three days the Roman general Titus pulled his forces back from the city. And during that time, it allowed every single Christian in the city of Jerusalem to flee. Not a single Christian lost their life or was made a slave in the fall of Jerusalem because they paid heed to what Jesus had said. Well, now, this sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall the tribes of the earth mourn. Well, the tribes of the earth here is in reference to those, uh, those tribes of Israel, which we know at this point there were only two tribes that were still maintained in any type of uh, structural way. It was the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. Those that had been a part of the nation of Judah that had been carried away into Babylonian captivity. Now something to keep in mind, folks, they were never called Jews until they went into Babylonian captivity. That's something that, that a lot of times, and I have to catch myself on this a lot, we find three different designations given to essentially the same group of people. We see them referred to as Hebrews. We see them referred to as Israelites. And we see them referred to as Jews. But then whenever you break that down, you find that there's some marked differences in those three. Every Jew was an Israelite. Every Jew was a Hebrew. But not every Israelite was a Jew. And not every Hebrew was a Jew. Do you remember the origin of the name Hebrew? Anybody remember that, where that originated? That was the title that the Canaanites gave to Abraham when he left his homeland and moved to Canaan. They referred to him as the Hebrew. Hebrew literally means from beyond the river. And that's because he came from the other side of the Jordan River. He crossed into the Promised Land, and so he and all of his descendants came to be known as the Hebrews. Well, there is an entire race of people today that descended from Abraham that cannot be referred to as Israelites, and you better not refer to them as Jews. And that's the Arab people. They descended from Ishmael. And since they're descendants of Abraham, they can be referred to as Hebrews. But then only those who descended from Jacob took on themselves the name Israelites or children of Israel. You remember later in his life, his name was changed to Israel. Esau's name was changed to Edom. They came to be known as the Israelites. Well, then after the kingdom divided, 
You had the nation of Israel, the nation of Judah. Well, only two of those 12 tribes remained in Judah, Judah and Benjamin. (coughs) Judah was the larger of those two tribes, the stronger, the more prominent. And so their name was the one that uh, was generally given to that group of people. They were known as Judeans. But then Babylon came and they were carried away into Babylonian captivity. Well, while they were there, you may remember, especially from reading the book of Daniel, that one thing the Babylonians tried to do was to give new names to all of them. Tried to remove any type of indicator that they were not Babylonian. You remember we have Daniel's name was changed to Belteshazzar. And then you had three men, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. And their names were changed to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And whenever you look at the names that they were given, the names Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael all have meanings that attribute praise to the one true God of heaven. But the names that they were changed to, Belteshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were all names that gave praise to the gods of the Babylonians. And something that I've always found interesting, we remember Daniel by his Hebrew name. We don't remember him as Belteshazzar. But we remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego by their Babylonian names, not by their Hebrew names. I've always found that interesting. But that's neither here nor there. But they tried to change the culture of the people. Well, among those two tribes, while they were in Babylonian captivity, in order to retain some of the uh, national heritage that they had, they began to refer to themselves as Jews. And then when they were allowed to go back and rebuild Jerusalem and reestablish their nation, they just retained that title Jews. And so you see there was a a difference there in those three groups. And oftentimes I think we have a tendency to use those interchangeably. But we need to realize who it is that's being referred to. But coming back to verse 30, notice that it says that the tribes of the earth those tribes that were still practicing Judaism. And like I said, at this point, it would have been Judah and Benjamin because all of those other tribes, when they were carried off into Assyrian captivity, they never did come back. Of course, over time, they came back to Samaria and came to be known as Samaritans. But they never did try to reestablish themselves as the tribal entities that they were before. But essentially, Jesus is saying every person that was still practicing Judaism at that time, they were going to mourn. Well, the reason for that was because the temple was going to be destroyed. That place that was the center of their religious life, that place that they went to to worship and to offer their sacrifices, it was going to be destroyed. That place that they took such pride in was going to be no more. They were going to mourn. And then... They shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Once again, this is symbolic. All this is doing is indicating that this is coming from divine origin. It's not saying that this is a literal, uh, physical return of Christ to earth. It's saying that the people are going to recognize that Jesus is the one that has brought this about. He prophesied it, and this is what is happening. 31, then he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. He says, after this has happened, after Jerusalem Uh, It has been destroyed, he said, the angels, they're going to gather all of those who are the elect. Now, there's some that look at this and say, well, this is a prophecy that none of the Christians were going to die in Jerusalem, that they were going to be scattered 
And then after Jerusalem fell, then they would all be united again, so to speak, under the umbrella of the church. That the angels, as it says here, they're going to bring about this restructuring. Well, I don't know that I would go so far as to say that that's what is being referred to here. But we do know that this is alluding to the fact that there would be unity, there would be peace with the Christians after this has taken place. Because remember, this punishment was not against the Christians. This punishment was against the Jews. Even in the minds of the Romans, they weren't coming to Jerusalem to kill Christians. They were coming to Jerusalem to try to subdue the Jews. And so Jesus is trying to help them to understand that this is not something that is intended to bring any type of hardship or detriment upon Christians at all. That God is going to be watching over them. He's going to send his angels to comfort them and maintain that unity even though they're scattered abroad. That Jesus is the one that is going to send them to do this. Any questions or comments? We're fixing to get into a parable. And before we do that, any questions or comments on what we've discussed thus far? Well, I appreciate it. We just, we have to keep everything in context. And it's so easy, especially whenever you see the similarity in the language that's being used in different places, it's so easy to look at this and and come away with the wrong interpretation. And that's why we do see many in the religious world today that have erring views in regard to this passage. Especially, and and we've talked about it just briefly, and I've not gone in depth into it because I don't fully understand it myself, this whole idea of the AD 70 doctrine that says that Jesus actually returned in AD 70, that the church did not literally come into establishment until AD 70, that uh, final judgment took place in AD 70. Basically, everything that we read about that talks about the end of time took place in A.D. 70. Well, if you look at this and you try to uh, interpret it 100% literally, then you're going to come away with that kind of a view, just like if you try to interpret Revelation literally, you're going to come away with a premillennial view that Jesus is going to come back, he's going to reign on David's throne from Jerusalem for a thousand years. That's why we have to understand the style of writing. We have to look at the context of the passages that we're looking at. And the whole key in looking at these two chapters is remembering verse 3. Remember what it is that Jesus is talking about. He's dealing with these questions that they have. Is he still, through this whole discourse, just talking to his disciples? Is this still part of that private? Yes. Yes, this, as I said, this... expecting the disciples to spread that out. Yes, okay. yes. Because you remember, in the previous chapter, he's, he stopped talking to the Jews. He's not, he's not devoting any time to that now, but he's spending time with those disciples, preparing them, because he knew that they were going to be the ones to carry this out. And so he's sharing this information with them, uh, mainly in response to the questions that they asked. They wanted to know what do we need to be looking for? What do we need to uh, have as a warning? Why do people dwell on that so much when they should be thinking about the salvation? Well, you know, it's, it's like we talked about in our sermon a couple of weeks back. So many times we get stuck on our opinions on things and or, or we get wrapped up in the things that we might refer to as being very stimulating, things that are exciting to us, and we try to break those things down and, and try to understand those things. So much of that does not have a bearing on our salvation. And you know, something that, that I've told people before when they try to talk about this idea of premillennialism or AD 70 or whatever the case may be, When it comes down to it, 
if we're ready when Jesus comes again, it really doesn't matter how he comes. It really doesn't matter the exact timeline or the structure or all of those things. That's not going to matter to us on that day. That's right. That's right. Well, you know, the Apostle Paul spoke several times about avoiding meaningless discussions. You know, things that don't have a bearing on our salvation. Things that are left up to speculation. And that's why, you know, a lot of times I'll tell you, now this is my opinion on this matter, or we can't back this up. But we don't dwell on those things. We try to get back to the things that really matter. And so, once again... Now, do I believe that premillennialism is wrong? Yes. Do I believe that 8070 doctrine is wrong? Yes. But when it comes down to it, if I'm ready when Jesus comes again, those things aren't going to matter to me. What's going to matter is I look up and I see my Lord coming, and I know I'm ready. That's what's going to matter. And so we need to focus upon the things that the Scriptures tell us about how to be ready for that day. Okay, we're going to stop there. And I think that's a good place to stop because we'll then pick up with this parable of the fig tree, uh, verse 32, next Sunday.